back to a brand new episode of the Channel Teachers Podcast. I am your host, Jay, and joining me as always are my two partners in crime, Tony and Brian. How you doing tonight, boys? I'm alright, and pressing the button. I'm doing alright, but I was just trying to look into something. Uh, this week, we are covering the uh, boxing K-drama bloodhounds which if you guys have been keeping up with the podcast we actually react to the trailer for this show and as soon as we saw it we were like oh we gotta cover this shit and so here we are i'm very excited to talk about it uh, it's a great show uh totally recommend it it's on netflix it's only uh, eight episodes super easy breezy each episode is an hour long really good personally i watched it subbed because dubs with foreign shows bother me because the lip sync is never right and I can't stop myself from looking at it. Anime, they can actually edit the lip flaps. It's not as easy to fix that problem with like live action dubs. So I just watched it in original Korean with subtitles on. I watched it in dub. And it didn't really bother me. Alright. How did you watch it, Tony? I, 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 now I'm curious. I did the same thing Ryan did. But I also had subtitles on. Ah. Okay. See, I don't know. It, it bugs me. I tried it, right? And I kept looking at the characters and seeing their mouths doing the whole classic kung fu movie dub thing. And it <laughs> annoyed the shit out of me to the point where I literally mid-sentence switched it to Korea. Oh no, I totally get it, Brian. If I could get through a Squid Game stub, I could get through this. I I did not get through Squid Game stub either. But Yeah, people are talking about how infamously bad that is. Yeah. Uh, especially with uh, What's-Her-Face, the, uh, the chick who was trying to get with the bad guy. Oh, the bitch! I don't remember her name, but the bitch who fucked the asshole in the bathroom. Yeah, I remember she her. Was infamously bad with uh, them getting wrong what she was saying. Yeah, the context is totally off. Like some of my friends would ask were asking me about that, and I'm like, yeah, no, it's it's completely different. It's night and day. So yeah, we're definitely gonna talk about it. This isn't our first foreign show, actually. It's actually our third Korean show, surprisingly enough, because we did do an episode on Squid Game. Uh, Tony wasn't here for that, but we did do an episode on Squid Game. I believe it's in the audio archives. If not, uh, you know, that sucks. But I feel like we did do a Squid Game episode. We also watched on Discord uh, as part of kind of like my Twitch community kind of bonding uh, activities. Uh, we did a watch party for the Korean teen zombie apocalypse show, All of Us Are Dead. Uh, me, Brian, David, our friend David, and our friend Seto all sat in a voice chat and watched the entirety of that show. And that show was fucking amazing. So much so to the point that our friend Darth, who was watching with us, like, we had watched the first two or three together, and this motherfucker Darth just was like, I gotta know what happens next, and he did the cardinal sin of, uh, that you're not supposed to commit when watching with, you know, a person or a group of people. He watched ahead, and he finished it before we did, because we were watching it as a group, and this motherfucker finished it. Classic Darth. But yeah. yeah. And uh, I just Google it, and apparently I could be wrong, because we've now got, uh, I think it's a little over 60 episodes, including the old stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, according to my just look just now, the closest thing that we had to a not American thing is uh, B Star. Okay. So we do have a Beastars episode up here. Okay, because I, I know we did. I knew we did one. I just didn't know if it was still there. Okay, cool. Season one. Hell yeah. Nice, nice, nice. So yeah, we will be covering Bloodhounds. This will technically be our first ever 
Korean show on the podcast, but you know, we're no strangers to K dramas and stuff. And let's be real, Exo Kitty might as well have been a K drama. Yeah. And this obviously yes. won't be our last. I actually have one that I want to pitch to the guys uh that I'm gonna mention in screen time. Um so we'll we'll talk we'll talk about it. And that weird limbo where um it was uh Twitch I believe we did do uh, Alice in Borderlands. Yeah, we did do Alice in Borderlands on Twitch. Uh, uh, yeah, we did do that one. Yeah, that no, that but that one's not a K drama. It was a J drama. To, but yes, it, 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 it was it was still foreign. TV in general. Yeah, it was still foreign. So yeah, yeah. But very excited to talk about that for sure. We're gonna go ahead and start with a spoiler-free discussion and kind of just general recommendations about. Bloodhound, just kind of our first impressions and, you know, what we thought about it. So I will go ahead and start with you, Brian. What were your thoughts on Bloodhound? And do you recommend it to the people at home who possibly haven't seen it yet? Well, first of all, I started this off like we saw our reaction. I was like, hey, we've done K-dramas, foreign stuff before, just offhandedly. Why don't I include this in the trailer? Don't know anything about it. It's Netflix. We included it. And then we, we were like, holy shit. We have to try this. And then we did. And it was really good. And then we decided to cover it. Because it worked out perfectly with time. I really enjoyed it. I really recommend it. It's probably the biggest surprise of the year so far. And... One of the best action scenes I've seen in a very long time. And it's not all action, though. It's got a lot of good drama and even some good comedy in it. And without getting too much into spoilers, it's very good. It's kind of kind of like this is a proto good example of Vigilante without it being superheroes. I totally agree with that. So... Tony, what were your first impressions of Bloodhounds, and do you recommend it to the folks at home who possibly haven't seen the show yet? Well, one thing I can say is I wasn't sure what I was going to be getting into, but after watching the first episode and just looking at it, I was like, oh, so we're going to be doing that. Because I was going to be, I was thinking one thing, like, just from the trailers, I had like a vague idea. Then actually watching it, I was like, oh, that wasn't what I expected. Neat. I like that shit. Also, I highly recommend this show. Okay, so, like the fight scenes and everything else, the drama stuff, great, perfect. I wasn't expecting what I, like, the whole big major plot, because I was thinking about something else, but it's still at that level of hood rat energy that I was looking for anyway. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, uh, yeah, it actually surpassed what I was expecting and gave us a very captivating tale about money crimes. Yeah. yeah. So, with my thoughts. So, if you guys are familiar with me at all from YouTube, or Twitch, in particular, if you're from the Twitch audience as well, you know that on Twitch, I have gotten dropped, like, in the deep end of the Yakuza rabbit hole. I've been playing the Yakuza series on Twitch for about a year now. I played Zero, Yakuza Kiwami, and I am... In the middle of Yakuza Kiwami 2, but since I have a PC and don't have room for my PS4, I'm going to probably have to just buy Kiwami 2 separately and play it there eventually, but that's neither here nor there. Point is, huge fan of the Yakuza series, and this gives me that kind of vibe. It is that street gritty kind of stuff that I love. If you remember me from comic YouTube, 
Uh, some of my favorite comic book characters are Spider-Man and Daredevil. And the best Spider-Man stories, best Daredevil stories, are the grounded, gritty, street-level stuff. And that's also some of my favorite Batman stuff as well. Um, so, like, you know, I love this kind of vibe. And another thing that you should know about me, if you've uh, gotten to know me through my content, because I've talked about it offhandedly in a lot of different stuff, I love the sport of boxing. Uh, the technical aspect, the, the heart and grit of it, and just in general, a, a bit of a personal anecdote, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side before he passed, uh, taught me how to box so that I could defend myself because I am physically disabled. Uh, he taught me how to box. Uh, he himself was a uh, boxer back in the day. And so, you know, he instilled a lot of that, like, gr determination and the uh, don't give up even if you hit the canvas type of attitude. And, you know, it, it's been a big influence on me for a really long time. And so, like, you combine a, cr a gritty crime drama with underdog boxing, and I am totally fucking in. You know, for the past few episodes, with the exception of Across the Spider-Verse from last week, where it was a movie, so obviously you watch it in one sitting. But for the past few episodes, you know, I spent, like, over the course of a week watching the show now the love and death one was because you know i was watching it with tony so we had to like do some time scheduling stuff but like lately i've been wanting to pace the stuff out because I, I needed i wanted to take breaks i needed to do other stuff but with bloodhounds i was so engrossed in it that i couldn't put it down like this is the first show in a while where i just straight up watched it in one sitting and it was so easy to because i just I couldn't stop it was just that good so in short i highly recommend you guys go check out bloodhounds totally worth it it's a fantastic show and these guys said the dub was solid so you know if you aren't into subtitles you know you, you can't keep pace with that kind of stuff you're not used to watching anime or whatever apparently the dub is good i i'll take the fella's word for it but uh personally for me the original korean was also pretty awesome uh i think the actors are phenomenal as brian mentioned the action is absolutely top notch uh as somebody who watches boxing regularly still watches boxing to this day the fucking technical ability of these actors in terms of throwing combinations their footwork all that shit is absolutely phenomenal and something a lot of people don't understand with uh boxing in terms of fight uh fighting style is that with boxing it can work actually very well as a fighting style that deals good with crowd control and you see that on full display with bloodhounds because there are so many of these big like 30 plus some odd motherfucker brawls and it is absolutely insane minimal cuts and edits just straight up in your face action and it is just so good so good highly recommended yep um the action and the story both together kind of reminded me of season one of a daredevil and that's saying a lot oh yeah and it has it has so much heart to it man which is going to be like our main focus of the topic, kind of the heart of the show and how the different characters, you know, demonstrated that heart or lack thereof heart, uh, which, again, is going to be our main topic when we actually get into the discussion proper. Oh, yes. So before we do that, of course, we can't do a podcast without first jumping right into the news with Brian. people 
we've got an update on a story. Super Random Lois. It was stated last week of recording that uh, it was being renewed for a new season, but the cast was going to be a little bit different. Well, we finally have confirmation. Who did they let go? Uh, who's going? Uh, they didn't say they were leaving the show, but they just said all of these people were not going to be cast members anymore. And those people are everyone but the Kents. Really? Damn! I was expecting it. I was expecting at least Lana and Sarah to stay around. At least what about the What about no. the Irons? At least as cast members, no. I. You know what? John Henry and Natasha do or Nat do eat up a lot of budget. So I actually do kind of understand minimizing them as well. But damn, dude. Oh shit. People suspect that at least most of these will be um just now reoccurring or special guest stars. Oh that makes sense. It's cheaper it's cheaper if you bill them as like uh recurring or season regulars as opposed to cast members. Yeah. That makes sense budget wise. Never mind. I retract that. But but it's not all bad news because also in this they did announce one new cast member. Okay. And I forgot the actor's name. I was going to Google it, but lost track of time. But anyway, he used to do that. They have playing Lex Luthor. Oh, shit. Nice. The next news story is actually tied. We've got three DC stories, actually, believe it or not. Most of it is DC related. Uh, the second one actually has to pertain to. Uh, What's currently going on in the theaters right now? Okay. I'm playing this. Andy Muscoletti. Sorry if I'm pronouncing Oh, wrong. Andy Muscoletti, the uh, the it director? Muscoletti. Yeah. He directed the it movies and the flash that's currently in theaters as of recording. Oh, he directed the flash? I thought it was Robert Zemeckis. Nope. Nope. That is, uh, that is Muschietti. Yep. Uh, the Flash infamously went through three, technically four, directors. Wasn't Zemeckis one of them? I think he was, but so was the team of Phil Lord and Chris Miller. Oh, wow. Yeah, that director has now been announced that he will direct another DC movie, The Brave and the Bold. Batman! Interesting. Okay. Well, I mean, he's got multiple in the current movie. That's fair. And also, one note that I didn't think of until recently. He also proved that he knows how to direct asshole kids. That's also true. I'm really curious on uh, the direction they go for Damien. I wonder if they're going to go for like a half Middle Eastern kid or something. It's something that I've been curious about because I like the take that the Bat Family Adventures or the Wayne Family Adventures webtoon has where Damien has more of the like olive Middle Eastern Mediterranean skin tone. Yeah. Because, you know, Talia and Raish. So, I wonder, I do wonder what direction they'll go with him. But yeah, no, that's true. Uh, Muschietti does have a, t a talent for directing kids. So, he might actually be able to do what I thought was impossible and make Damien likable? Question? That because, still um, That still sounds wrong. Remember in the original It movie, well, not... The first it movie, I should say. Uh, the kid who was played by Finn Wolfhard. He was an asshole, but also likable. Fair. Richie was but, fucking uh, dope, though. Uh, he's probably my favorite character. Uh, oh, yeah, indeed. But uh, moving on to animated. It was announced that uh, Beast Boy 
It's getting his own show. Oh, sweet. Uh, they still got uh, Greg Sipes. Because like, he's like the definitive Beast Boy animated voice. Most likely because they say that it's a spinoff of Teen Titans Go. Honestly, Beast Boy is the funniest part of Teen Titans Go, so I'd actually watch that. This new show called uh, Beast Boy Lone Wolf is going to be animated, 10 episodes, and they say it's going to be less wacky and more action -y. Man, I would love to see, I, I would hope for a, actually a Beast Boy and Cyborg show if they were going to do a spinoff, because like, those two together, man, it's it's fantastic. Indeed, and uh, I don't know if this is confirmed or not, but I think there's at least speculation that they're going to be like diving into the multiverse with this show. Oh, cool. I mean, the multiverse is pretty trendy right now. Yep, and apparently they addressed it recently in Teen Titans Go. Oh, cool. Okay. But our last story doesn't have to do with DC. But it does have to do with something that we actually brought up recently, or you mentioned recently, Jay. Oh, Day yeah? Today. Exo Kitty officially renewed. Yay! I'm happy. Now, now we get to see more of the mess. Oh, Let's yay! Let, and I'm not just I'm not just excited because our Exo Kitty video is doing really well. At, which, by the way, thank you guys for supporting that video. It was our first official YouTube return full podcast episode vid. So thank you guys for liking, subscribing, and sharing and all that. Like, people actually watch it during the premiere, which the Spider-Verse video is doing really well as also. So, again, thank you for that. But yay! More Exo Kitty! That's great! Time for some more fucking drama! Oh, yeah. Piping hot tea. Oh yeah, indeed. And with that, we're done with the news. All right, so it looks like it's that time again. It is screen time. Well, folks, we are at another screen time. That is the part of the show where the three of us talk about the various different things and pieces of media we've been indulging in in between podcast episodes. That could range from video games to TV shows to anime, books, different things like that. So, Tony, do you have anything for us this week or were you busy once again? We have a little bit of something that I just watched to just get my mental juices flowing, which I still need to finish it. But it's an anime basically about an Amyoji dying. But reincarnating in a fantasy world where he still has his memories from his previous life and his uh, abilities as an Amyoji. Oh, that's cool. Western fantasy world. It's fucking hilarious because the body that he inhabited didn't have any real magical potential because he's just uh, what's on the surface a bastard baby. But it's something completely different. It, it feels kind of Game of Thronesy in a way. Okay, cool. However, however, he still just kicks the shit out of things with his like Shikigami bullshit. It's great. Nice. And he has he's able to access his past life's familiars, which are just very different kinds of yokai. Even a fuck you dragon. It's oh, great. that's dope. Oh, yeah. I'm seven episodes in, so I think, you know, the typical 12 episode fair, maybe 13. Is mm. this on Crunchyroll? It is, yes. Okay, cool. Nice. It, I mean, it's not going to be anybody's cup of tea, but I just kind of watched it because I felt inspired because I wanted to throw in some sort of... So, yeah, for some stuff for Japanese lore. Okay, yeah, uh, cool. It's just... <laughs> It's more like for personal like research if I wanted to like dig deep into telling like certain stories within my own story that are just kind of like eh, what I'm oh, yeah. currently working on. Oh yeah, I get it. I get it. All and right. Other than 
it's just a bunch of also just random YouTube videos. <laughs> just uh, Crusader Kings three because of the Game of Thrones mod, and also <laughs> a two hour dissertation on like debunking some random motherfuckers. Yep, Spider-Man the worst Spider uh, debunking the worst Spider Man review, uh, Spider Man PS four review ever. I actually watched yeah. that. Uh, it was Hilarious. recommended to me as well. Uh, really good video. Oh, excellent work uh, from the channel uh, Colin World or Collins World? Yep, Collins World. Yep. Great video. Uh, highly recommend those who actually like that uh, game where the worst person <laughs> makes the worst critiques but also flip flops on certain things. Oh man, uh, some of yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just laughable. It's great. It's great. It's is mess. It's, oh, the original. Uh, it's just even uh, Collins World said he didn't want to give. He didn't want to put the original video in the link in his description box, which will lead to individuals just hate commenting on it. Smart move. On your end, bro. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's definitely that's definitely a, a good call. Like, because you don't want you don't want to invite harassment. Because like, even if you disagree with somebody's work, you know, you don't want to invite negative, uh, you know, negative press. So that that was that's a classy move on his part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also, the thing, if the individual who made the dumb takes actually want to watch your video and just wanted to react to that that's the fairest option yeah for sure hate bomb people you know because of what the fuck reason that you may have yeah and i mean like, that's kind of the policy of this podcast right like you know mm-hmm. I, yeah. I i i made it i made it a mission to only cover th- uh you know shows that we all like but you know we're still gonna have to address you know stuff that we didn't like about the show because no work of fiction or just work in general is perfect but that doesn't mean you don't like something yeah and if it- unless your name is sandman fair. oh my god fair yeah but <laughs> i'm just joking cuz uh it's the thing we ran into last week with uh into the Spider-Verse. Three of us had things that were major nitpicks and that pissed us off because we were big nerd mad. And poor Brian here was like, I thought you liked this movie. We did. We just had, like, nerd mad stuff. Which, by the way... Damn. Y'all got real mad about. Which, which yeah. confused me, but after you explained it, I understood it, and I even took some of your criticization into play especially in the final uh, rating yeah which by the way yeah. go watch that video if you have it it's a it's a good discussion De- definitely go go watch it shameless pug is totally not shameless yeah it, i know you can barely hear my ass but i'm making strides actually being heard this time on the recording <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. The levels seem to be looking fine. Okay, so as for me, I spent Father's Day watching a bunch of stuff with my dad. Uh, One of those being the Black Clover movie on Netflix, Black Clover, The Sword of the Wizard King, which is a movie in the universe of the Black Clover anime slash manga. And for those of you Black Clover fans uh, watching this, if you are a Black Clover fan and you have this question, I did look into it. This movie is indeed canon. Uh, It takes place in between the current arc uh, that is going on in the anime or like what's a, the arc that's supposed to happen in the anime, but the anime got put on pause. It happens before that and after the elf arc for people who are interested in the timeline stuff. And this movie adds to the lore, but it doesn't impact the story too much to where it messes with the overall direction. So I understand why uh, how it is actually canon. Now, some people might be pissed off about this because I know a lot of anime fans feel like with anime movies, 
it's weird to have them be canon because not everybody is going to go out of their way to watch a movie for an anime. But I feel like making movies actually mean something more to anime is the better move because, you know, back in my day, when I used to watch the, the Dragon Ball animated uh, movies like Broly and like the original Broly Legendary Super Saiyan, the uh, Cooler movies, the Bojack movie, all that shit, completely non-canon, cool fights, but it, they don't mean shit. But then, you know, we move to modern Dragon Ball and those movies are canon and they're pretty fucking great. Battle of Gods movie, fantastic. Resur Resurrection F, okay. Uh, the Broly movie, amazing. The superhero movie, absolutely fantastic. And then, you know, you have other anime like Demon Slayer that made the Mugen Train arc into a movie, which flowed so much better. So much so that I don't understand why they still made it into an anime arc, but it's neither here nor there. Point being, this Black Clover movie does a really good job of like capturing the spirit, not while not while affecting the story without overcomplicating it. And also, it's been so long since I've seen Black Clover since the anime has been put on pause. It was just great to see Asta and the gang again. So, if you've been missing Black Clover. Uh, definitely go check out Black Clover Sword of the Wizard King. Uh, definitely recommend it. It was a lot of fun. The other thing I watched, uh, did not watch this one with my dad, but I, I watched this one more for myself, was another movie that's on Netflix that I've been meaning to check out, uh, which is Enter Galactic. And Enter Galactic is an animated movie created by Kid Cudi. Also starring Kid Cudi, he voices the main character, and he provides the soundtrack for the movie as well. It's this kind of adult romance kind of love drama kind of thing that has this daydreamy space vibe as part of its aesthetic. I don't want to go too much into it because it's a movie, and I'm not going to just spoil the plot for you, but... Uh, if you like Kid Cudi, uh, he makes some really good music for this, and it's animated similar to the style of, like, Into the Spider-Verse, so aesthetically it's really cool. So, I would personally recommend that one. And the third and final thing that I have for screen time is the thing that I want to pitch to the guys to maybe eventually cover. I stopped myself from watching more of it because I was like, no, this is good. I think the guys might like this too. I watched the first episode of another K-drama on Netflix called Copycat Killer. And it reminds me a lot of Death Note uh, in the sense of it's a story about a group of investigators who are trying to track down the serial killer. And the serial killer is leaving all these clues, very a la like Zodiac killer type thing. And so it's like this psychological murder mystery kind of race against the clock. Like we got to stop him before he kills again kind of thing. Uh, it's 10 episodes. Watch the first one. Really like it. It's very well paced, uh, very gripping. Again, I think this is one we could definitely cover for the podcast. So, like, the only reason I didn't continue watching is because I wanted to pitch the guys to see if we want to cover it. But, yeah, well, what do you guys think? Would you be into that? Did I sell you on it? <laughs> yeah, you sold me. Yeah, I'd be interested. We're a little busy right now, but yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Cool. Yeah, I, th I think it'd be cool. But yeah, that's pretty much it for screen time. So we are going to transition into our next segment. Hey. Oh, wait, didn't I? Th oh, for some reason, I thought you went first, Brian. My you bad. Brian. I almost skipped you, Brian. My fault. Tony went first. My fault. My bad, Brian. Brian, uh, what, what are some of the stuff you've been watching or consuming in between podcast episodes? Okay, so if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, 
Well, first of all, I didn't watch that much, but I did watch two movies and a little bit of a show. Um, I, uh, in the spirit of, uh, you know, the Transformers going on in the theaters and stuff, I finally sat down and watched Bumblebee. Oh, really? Oh, that movie's fucking awesome. It is. It It is honestly the best, my opinion, the best live-action Transformers film so far. The first, no, the first Transformers movie was still really good. It was, but I think I prefer this one a little bit more. Understandable. But, uh, yeah, because I will still argue about the first one, too. The first one was not bad. But, uh, this one, granted, it, with Bumblebee, it does get a little cliche and a little, like, predictable, but I think part of that is on purpose because it is homaging the time that it is set in, the 80s. Yeah, and, it, ha it has a very kids on bikes, or I guess kids in robot cars um, kind of vibe to it. Oh yeah, for sure. And John Cena, the villain, was actually pretty good. He was fantastic. Yeah. Um... Uh, was a uh, little sad to see how it ended just within the universe as a whole, but um, I'm still excited to see where we go from here. It makes me more excited for the new movie coming out. Which, on that note, I, I will I will go ahead and announce here, uh, we're not covering it for the podcast because movies are expensive and we all can't watch it. Uh, you know, we all can't afford... Uh, all to see all the blockbusters on time but i do plan on going to see it because uh beast wars in particular uh, holds a very special place in my heart so i'm probably gonna see it next week and i will talk about it on screen time nice um the other thing that i i watched another movie tell me what you think of it so the other thing sure will do All right, so uh, the other one that I watched was a movie called The Lost City. It's an older movie from, I think, Flash. Um, it stars Channing Tatum and Sandra Bullock. Don't think I've seen anything on that. It's, um, it's really good. It's, um, she plays a, uh, an, a romance author. Oh, oh, now it's coming to me. I've seen the trailer. Yeah, uh, Channing Tatum plays her cover, her cover model. She gets kidnapped because one of her books mentions this, like, artifact in real life. And so this rich douchebag kidnaps her to... See if she can find the real life thing. Isn't the rich Daniels. asshole uh, Daniel Radcliffe? Yup. Yep, I, I do remember the trailer. He in to try to rescue her, but he knows jack shit about action. But uh, it was actually really good, and some of it was down to the writing, but I think a big portion of it was down to the, the three big players there oh cool. where 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 was it on uh out of curiosity just in case the people at home want to check place. it out okay cool but yeah um Sandra Bullock's character could be very cliche in one note but she's a very good actress so she adds a little bit of nuance to it to make it not so bland and then Channing Tatum he does that thing that I've seen rarely, maybe somewhat from like Jackie Chan and other people, where it's like the actor knows so much about action that they know how to portray someone who knows Jack shit. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. So Daniel, 
Daniel Radcliffe is amazing as a villain. I would like to see him more. In this one, he plays kind of like a little bit of like what you'd expect from like an Iron Man villain. He's also just, I, I'm so glad he's diving more into comedy because like, you know, as a Potter fan, I became a fan of Daniel and oh, just man. watching all his like indie comedy stuff. Dude is fucking hilarious. If you've ever wanted to see a really weird, really funny movie, go watch Swiss Army Man. Yeah, I've been meaning to see that. Also, I've been meaning to see his uh, show. Oh, the Miracle Oregon Trail? Workers? Miracle Workers. Isn't, isn't that the one that's set on the Oregon Trail? That's one season of it. Ah, okay. Each season, it takes place in a different time. Gotcha. And the Oregon Trail was one season. But uh, it's also got Steve Buscemi in it, and it's really... That was really cool. I hadn't seen it yet. There's one in the Wild West where he does like a burlesque show, Daniel Radcliffe. Oh, cool. Oh, that sounds hilarious. That sounds funny. But the last... It was. But the last thing, I've only like five episodes in, five, six episodes in, but I did start watching the Star Trek Lower Deck. And? and I really enjoy it. Nice. Uh, it, it's very like, definitely delves into what the uh, life would be like working on it as like the lower peons of the spaceship. So is it like the Orville in that sense? Because the Orville does a really good job of that kind of shit. Kind of, yeah, but instead of focusing on the main crew, we're focusing on in like the people that are in the background. Ah, okay, cool. Which, by the way, we still haven't heard whether or not the Orville is going to get renewed or not. I pr so it's probably not. Uh, last I heard, uh, what's his name? Seth the MacFarlane. Runner, Seth, Seth MacFarlane said that he was hopeful, but then the writer shark happened. Oh. So we don't know for sure, but anyway, um, Lower Decks is actually really good. It's got a good cast. Uh, one of the leads is uh, Jack Quaid, aka oh. Huey from Nice Boys. Which, by the way, we forgot to mention it, but he does an awesome little cameo as uh, Spider Gwen Speeder in uh, He does. Spider Verse. He does. It was pretty dope. But it's hard to say too much yeah. about the show because I'm only like five, six That's episodes great. in. But it is really cool because one one of our leads is like an ass kicker, an ass kisser. The other one is just like, yeah, fuck it. And then we got two other leads who are both various different versions of nerds. One of them has like a little cybernetic in him, kind of similar to Jordy. Jordy. But uh, he's still getting used to it, and it sometimes malfunctions and stuff. Nice. But it's it's very funny, very workplace comedy, but set in outer space and on a spaceship. But I did really enjoy it. But that's all I watched. Now we can move on. Yep. Also, real quick. Uh, I do want to give a special shout out uh, to Cap once again because Cap, recommend uh, in the spirit of uh, this episode, uh, last week during screen time, Cap recommended after I mentioned that I watched uh, Creed three, Cap recommended I check out this Shonen Jump manga called Do Retry. Uh, if you have the Shonen Jump app, which I highly recommend you get because it's three dollars a month. All the Shonen Jump titles you could want. Uh, if you read a lot of Shonen manga, it's a worthy investment for sure. But I, I read uh, the five chapters that are out for Do Retry, and it is this uh, 
gritty, not gritty, but it's this boxing anime manga about this kid who is an up-and-coming contender in Japan post-World War II. So it's got it's got a really good aesthetic to it. It has this like if you've seen Demon Slayer, it's the same kind of like mix of still partially traditional, still partially westernized Japan and uh seeing the clash of the mixing of the two cultures, especially since boxing is a distinctly western sport is very interesting and to see how japan has its own take on the heart of the boxer concept which we've seen in stuff like hajime no ippo obviously one of the most famous examples of it but uh this does a good job of displaying that as well the other Manga I checked out on the Shonen Jump app just on a whim because the cover looked cool was uh, this anime, or I keep calling it say an anime, we don't even know if it's getting an anime yet, but this manga on the Shonen Jump app called Seventh Garden, which is essentially, from what I understand, I've only read like the first 10 chapters, it is a series that focuses on a war between angels and succubi so sexy anime succubus says succubi i'm totally into this it's not as edgy as i was expecting um the action is really solid really like the art definitely recommend it uh so go check it out read more kids it's good for you Reading good. All right. But with that out of the way, for sure. Oh, man, I still remember those PBS ads. But now uh, that that's out of the way, we can officially transition over to trailer talk. This is the segment where we will be taking a short intermission and then coming back with our thoughts on some trailers that Brian has curated for us, and we will leave a link in the description down below to a corresponding playlist so you can see those trailers for yourself and uh, pause the video and react along with us. So Brian, tell the folks at home what we will be reacting to tonight. Well, um, recently, as of recording this, Netflix had their little to them special where uh they did a lot of trailers but uh we're gonna be having like a little bit of a to dumb sandwich because the first and last trailer aren't from to dumb but the rest are okay cool the first one is called wonder well it's a movie that i didn't know was coming it's um i think it's a lower budget lesser you know uh fantasy story starring this 12 year old girl who's in Italy, but then gets transported to like this fairy tale world. Ah, oh, so she gets Isakai. Like, kinda, it seems like. Not much is really known about it. They don't know for sure who they're playing. I'm guessing based on the images, but uh, two cast members of note is uh, Rita Ora. As in the R and B singer. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been wondering where she was at. And I, and I believe she's playing the villain. Interesting. And uh, just to go to show you how long this film has been in production, playing, I'm guessing the mentor character, the fairy godmother as character, is the late great Carrie Fisher. Oh shit. Really? What? Really? Hello. Yeah. That's Apparently dope. This is her, her last thing that she ever did. Wow. Just on that alone, that means I gotta check it out. Just, just for, just out of respect for the princess. That's why I included it. And uh, so, to the dumb, 
we got Heart of Stone, a new Netflix spy thriller movie starring Gal Gadot. Oh, cool. She was really good in uh, Red Notice, the one that she had with The Rock. A video called Welcome to the Archies, where it's uh, teasing Netflix's new project that they just announced called The Archies. Which so is this about like Archie and his band? Yes, but it's Indian. They're Indian. Hmm. It's an Indian time period musical. Interesting. About Archie and his friends. Is it live action? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm intrigued. And then another behind the scenes thing. I don't know how much this is going to hit for us Americans, but I included it anyway. Squid Game Season 2 cast announcement. All right. Then we got a trailer for uh, a new Netflix show coming out called The Three Body Problem. Interesting title. It, it's a sci-fi, think alien conspiracy TV show. Oh, done okay. By, uh, done by uh, Game of Thrones D and D. Never mind. But uh, but also a third party is show running with them. Okay. Uh, maybe and maybe there's still hope there. It, it looks like it's gonna cut between maybe sixties uh, or seventies in China and uh, modern day in America, and uh, the American lead is uh, the Hispanic chick from uh, from a uh, Baby Driver. Oh, cool! She's hot. Yeah, and also. Um, Wong himself. Oh, nice. Gonna be good, good for Benedict Wong. Also, also D and D are bringing back for this both John, uh, not John, uh, Sam, Sam and Davos. Oh, nice. Oh, really? Yeah, for this show, and it looks promising, but uh. Then we got a quick little teaser. Don't know if it shows anything or not. Called um, Avatar: The Last Airbender for Elements trailer. I think that's what it's called. Is this for the live it's action thingy? Yeah. Oh no. Then keeping up with the oh no, we have the One Piece trailer. Actually, you don't know if it's an oh no for me or not. I just said I have a lot to say. But uh. Anyway, and then last, we're ending with something that might even be a little bit more contentious than One Piece. And it's a trailer that came out yesterday as of recording. Very interesting. Alright, so now what? Raven we'll... the Hunter. I forgot this was going to be a thing! What? what? Yeah. Who's playing Craven again? Is it Butler? Aaron Taylor Johnson. Oh, right. Kick-ass. Yeah. Quicksilver, I guess, is what he's more known for. Yeah. Fuck. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, he did have a vaguely Eastern European accent as Quicksilver. Also, I never saw it, but I heard that he was amazing in a bullet train. He was. He was. It's on Netflix. You should check it out. So then it's a nice breezy watch. But yeah, those are the trailers we'll be reacting to. Uh, like I said, we will be providing a playlist in the description down below. So while we take a brief transition through the magic of energy, you can pause the video, YouTube people, and watch the trailers yourselves. And we'll be right back with our rapid fire thoughts. Until then, we shall return. And we're back. 
All right, folks, we have watched all the trailers, and I'm not going to lie. I am upset. Uh, <laughs> my disappointment is immeasurable, and my day is ruined. You'll have to find out which trailer did that. It's not the one you might think, either. We'll talk about it. So, where do we want to start? Let's start with the good ones. The, the Gal Gadot action movie, uh, Heart of Stone, looks fucking awesome. Yep, I said it, I said it in the, uh, when we were watching it, great. but it's kind of like the uh, Wonder Woman sequel that uh, we wanted. For sure. She was on her, like, Tom Cruise action shit. I really dig it. She's really proven herself as a bona fide action star, not just with Wonder Woman, but uh, with Red Notice as well. She's just really killing it, man. I mean, I knew she had action chops ever since her appearance in the Fast movies, but, like, she is really making a name for herself in the action genre. So, the other one, Wonder Will, which I kept wanting to call Wonder Wall and sing the song, Wonder Will. Looks also yeah. very interesting. The late great Carrie Fisher uh, is in it, as Brian mentioned at the top of the segment. So, of course, just because it is the last thing she did, we're going to check it out because Carrie Fisher, man. But also, it just looks like a very fun concept. The world looks pretty cool. Yeah. The effects are interesting. I like Rita Ora's, like disney villain-esque look to her she looks like a character out of once upon a time and i don't mean that as an insult i used to really love once upon a time actually yeah back when it was good yep also like once upon a time kind of has an interesting mythos where it's like the two famous people each one is like the ruler of a certain world yeah she because she said in the trailer like you know the town is mine the forest is yours so like it, they're two separate like dimensions kind of like kind of like how there's like to bring it back to once upon a time they have like storybrook and then they have the enchanted forest fairy tale land place i forget the actual terminology it's been so many years now granted like one of my first big series was once and i did cover it while it was good i covered it all the way up to like the pan era and i even covered uh up to i did videos up until the frozen character started showing up that was the last the last review i remember doing of once upon a time was the review of the episode where we get the backstory between Charming and Kristoff. Which, those are some weird words I never thought would mix together, but they did. And it was yeah, actually it's pretty still, interesting. It still baffles me that they included Elsa and the character that Elsa was based on. And you know what the crazy part about that is? Just to go on... A little bit more of a Once Upon a Time tangent. They came out, like, in Once Upon a Time, the same year that Frozen released. Like, that is yep. insane. This is all that kind of timing when it comes to, like, uh... I mean, I guess they could tell that that was going to be a worldwide phenomenon. And, I mean, they weren't wrong. So, let's be honest, Jay. They were kind of running out of uh, characters. Also fair. Uh, but other stuff. What what else are we going to talk about? Um, the um, the uh, hmm? the three body problem. That is really fascinating. Oh yeah. Was, I was don't know what the fuck was happening mm -hmm. in that trailer, but I'm intrigued for sure. Especially, like, what the fuck is yeah, the deal with I, the sword lady? Yeah. She was hot. I want to know what, who she was cutting up. Yeah, let's do it. Yep. Let's go. Yep. Alright, so... Anybody who's followed my anime content 
is probably wondering, all right, Jay, you've been beating around the bush. Let's talk about it. Well, before we talk about it, I want to talk about another series that I have done a lot of content on over the years um, and actually was a big thing for my channel as well. And that is, of course, Avatar The Last Airbender. I have very little faith in this series. Not the franchise itself, but the Netflix series. Mostly because Mike and Brian, no relation to our Brian, um, have, you know, openly stated that once again, very much like the M. Night Shyamalan Ding Dong movie, they backed out because of creative differences with the team behind the show and when the creators of the show distance themselves from the project you know it's going to be bad so i have negative hope for this series to actually be good but it can't be any worse than ong yeah. and soka did you guys see the first look image yeah. that they did for the main war uh no Okay, it's not I'm bad. I'm entertained by the helmet. The helmet looks cool. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, I actually like some of the Aang looks right out of the. Oh yeah. Uh, but and everyone else, they made changes to it, but they're, they're not changes. changes. Yeah, they're not changes. I'm mad at like aesthetically. Like Sokka, they gave him kind of mm -hmm. kind of like some native inspired yeah. armor yeah aesthetically i'm not mad at this but again because the creators yeah. have distanced themselves from this project oh, i just mm -hmm. don't think this is going to work and it probably is going to be a show we're going to avoid <laughs> to be honest well, my... i'll check it out at a yeah. yeah no no i'm gonna bring it up on screen time but we're not dedicating a whole episode to this bullshit no hey but you know something we might actually dedicate an episode to is a One Piece because it, it, it's going to be a little bit one sided. But uh, listen, man, I I'm a I'm a One Piece fucking super fan. I've been into One Piece for a very long time. Uh, it is, in my opinion, one of the greatest shonen manga ever penned with one of the most creative and in-depth worlds I have ever had the pleasure of reading in fantasy and like it's just it means so much to me uh, One Piece is one of those series where the fans of One Piece even though it's a shonen manga go crazy over exposition chapters and lore dump chapters where no punching happens and we just learn about the economics of the world like that's how good the world building is for this series appreciate a great bit of world building when you're wanting to learn when you want to learn about the economics of like parts of the world how the currency flows that shit is insane. Listen, awesome. And that's the and that's the cool thing about One Piece, right? Like the world is so fucking interesting. And that was one of the scariest things that I thought about with this live action in terms of my fears. Like how are you going to bring this world that I love so much to life? And before you get to uh, mm -hmm. talking about how it actually delivered or didn't deliver, mm -hmm. I just want to say that for me myself, everything about this screams like I'd I'd love it because pirates kind of superpowers esque, and then also the D and D world building side of me, but also in the same vein, by the time I like felt interest in it. It had already reached past a thousand episodes. That's not so. true. It didn't hit a thousand episodes until last year. Uh, 
but I will say, and this is something that every One Piece fan says, so I'm just going to get the obligatory thing out of the way. Read the manga. It's much faster. The pace is better. You don't have to worry about filler or any bullshit. And it's just, it's such a good read. I know a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to read something where you say it doesn't get good until the first 40, until you finish the first 40 chapters. You're going to fly through those 40 chapters, dog. Like, if you guys take my advice from screen time and download the Shonen Jump app, and you decide, hey, One Piece is coming out in August. I'm going to read the first 30 chapters of One Piece, which is probably how much they're going to cover for the uh, first season. Although it looks like, obviously, they might do like content up to the uh, chapter 100 where they actually hit the grand line, which I'm very curious how they're going to blitz through all this. Um, and what they're going to have to cut. That's going to be something interesting that I'm going to have to see as a fan. Uh, but in terms of like how it delivered and stuff. Bringing the world to life. I think they did a fantastic job. You can tell Oda is involved in this. Because the designs, the ship, the music. It all feels very one piece it's very distinctly one piece luffy perfect casting he looks straight up like luffy people might be a little wary on his personality because he seems a little bit more quippy than luffy is but luffy's also a jokey very funny very goofy character so in order to properly translate that to live action, you have to do a different form of humor. And I think this could work for a live action version of a shonen protagonist that will hopefully come off as less annoying. Which I've never had that problem with Luffy, unlike most shonen protagonists, which I don't like for the most part. Uh, the only shonen protagonist I've ever actually thought was like, okay, I like this character a lot, is Goku. Um... But that's because I've followed Goku since he was, like, a little kid. Uh, but Luffy, I didn't have that problem. I, I've always liked Luffy. And I feel like it really does capture his essence pretty well from what we've seen. Uh, Zoro, super easy to translate. Badass, samurai, green hair. Perfect. Uh, I've seen Emily Rudd in the Fear Street Netflix uh, movie slash series. I think it's just a movie. She was great in that. It's so, yeah. So it's a movie series. She's in that. She's really good in it. Uh, so I know she can act. Uh, she had a good vibe in terms of Nami's sass and aggression, especially early East Blue Nami. And the whole not a crew moment definitely felt like something that like early Zoro and Nami would like have. So that was cool. Uh, the glimpses of the Straw Hats that we got to see of Zoro, um, Zoro, Luffy, Sanji, and Usopp, and Nami were all really solid. Uh, we got to also see the Baratier in one shot as well, the restaurant where we first meet Sanji. So again, we know that at least we're going to get up to that arc. So we got a lot of stuff to cover. And also, uh, this trailer gave me some nightmare fuel because I am terrified of clowns. And they did a really good job of bringing Buggy to life because I always knew. Because in the manga, Buggy doesn't scare me because Buggy is so much of a pathetic loser that I laugh at him and with him. So he doesn't scare me, but I always knew if Buggy w existed in real life, he would terrify me. And I was right. He absolutely terrified me. Yeah, and Brian, don't you dare do that same expression. You I will punch you. Bastard. I will punch you right through this fucking screen. Um, and uh, where would you punch our 
our friend here, bro. Listen, man, I'll, I'll punch I'll punch him right in the berries. I'll punch him in his gumu gumus. Uh, oh no! Well, speaking Damn, of gum gumus, by the way, the only major complaint I have about this trailer, which is gonna make or break it, honestly, in terms of the show, is the gum gum powers. Hollywood's CGI for stretching is terrible. It was terrible for Mr. Fantastic. It was terrible for Ralph Dibney and The Flash. Like, so much so that, like, they had to, like, when they had to recast him, they did this weird, like, totally horrible CGI thing for him. But, it's, yeah, stretching has never been good, and Luffy mm. is our main character. So, this is gonna be rough. Yeah, um, even, uh, the Marvel, uh, Miss Marvel, they changed her powers because of that, and there are rumors that for the Fantastic Four movie, they might change Reed for the same There's no thing. way! They can't, they can't, they what? can't. Brian, Brian, Brian. No way, that's <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> I well, I would well, there riot. Are many rumors out there, some that have been like totally debunked. Like the one that stated that uh they were looking at Mila Kunis for the thing. Let's go ahead. So was, since we're talking about Marvel that stuff hilarious. that is terrible, let's go ahead and stop beating around the bush. Oh. Let's talk about it. Big mad. Fuck this movie. Yeah, y'all got very mad. Fuck, fuck this movie, dog. Fuck this movie. Fuck this movie. Fuck this movie. Fuck, fuck this, this movie. movie's mama. It was like, like, how I don't. Fuck this movie's dad. Their grandpa. Their gr oh, their great uncle Sam. I I don't give a fuck. <laughs> fuck all of them. No. No. They're, no. They're not Nah, listen, listen, man, listen, listen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak very, I'm gonna speak very, very close to the mic so you can clearly understand this. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead, Tony. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go before I, before I go on my rant. Go ahead. I will tell this to Brian. I'm gonna be mad at you for at least a week, just so you know, because you. Show me that. That is fair. Hey, I, Brian, you, you... I didn't see it. I just added it on name alone. You did, but you subjected oh, us to this. That, yeah, you know, but you, you're still going to take responsibility for this disappointment. Well, hey, good news is next time I see you physically, Tony, will be next week. That's fair. All right, so I'm going to speak... Very close to the mic, so you can hear this clearly. I, Craven the Hunter, has, you know, only one good story, arguably. However, comma, that story is one of the greatest Spider-Man stories ever told in Craven's Last Hunt. J.M. D. Mateus did a masterful job. Of taking this goofy 60s joke character and making him this nuanced, complex villain who is constantly seeking a challenge and validation and eventually just couldn't put up with the fact that he couldn't be better. And so the madness that drives a man to. Now, hearing all that, you would think, hey, that would make an awesome movie, right? Hey, that would make an awesome video game. Yeah. Y you know how we're gonna get awesome Craven? It ain't, it sure as fuck ain't gonna be from this movie. Go play Spider-Man 2 when it comes out. Cause that's how we'll get good Craven. This, this isn't yep. this isn't bargain bin Craven. This isn't Walmart Craven. This isn't Craven. This isn't we have Craven at home. This is like 
Chinese knockoff Craven with like a backwards we N. No. <laughs> no. Oh man, no. Wish Craven. This is dollar store bargain bin Craven, so it's like fifty cents. I I, I hate it. I hate it. Aaron Taylor Johnson is a phenomenal actor. Uh, he's done great work, and I think if he was put in a better movie, like if they had cast him as Craven the Hunter in like the MCU and let him do that, I think he would have done great. But no, they didn't. They cast him in this. And here's the thing. You know? Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed Morbius, you know right? Oh yeah, go ahead, Tony. My bad. They also wasted. They also wasted Russell Crowe. They did waste Russell Crowe. But I'm sure Russell Crowe got a big check out of that. Look. So good for him. Good, good for him. Good for Taylor Johnson because they begin paid, but. That is no excuse. Yeah. Whatever I saw. Yeah. And look, I enjoyed Morbius. Me and me, Tony and Brian, we watched it with the boys in Discord, uh, for one of our community movie nights, and we had a blast with it because it had this cheesy early 2000s superhero film vibe to it and that was fun to watch with friends i did not have fun watching this trailer i was physically hurt watching this trailer brian saw the pain on my face he looked me in my eyes and saw how much i was hurt which is why I will be angry with Brian for at least a couple weeks. <laughs> well, to be fair, mm, so I think it was only I think it was only going to be one week. see there. Mm. I think it was only going to be one or two weeks, and then the Rhino reveal. Yep. Yep. It was gonna be fun. like I was. I was willing to be like, "All right, Brian, you you done goofed, but it's forgivable. We do, we're doing it for the podcast." But then the Rhino thing happened, and I was like, "Nope." I even said straight up, "Like Brian can tell you because you know we don't actually show you guys the reaction part because of copyright reasons." But Brian can tell you when we were reacting to the trailers, I literally was like, "Nope, I'm turning it off." I'm trying to get off. And Brian was like, wait, it has a couple more seconds. I was like, fine, Brian. I'll keep playing. And then, you know, it just shows the date. But yeah, fuck you. I'm not seeing this movie. I'm not giving it money. I'm not even going to bootleg and, it. Uh, you know what the funny thing is? Uh, people, behind, people listening and watching. When we were watching it, there is actually a thing in the comics where Craven becomes like kind of a weird lion and given the trailer it looked like they might be going that way we even discussed it but then nope not only did they not do that they then also in the same beat made rhino a were rhino and then the powers that they do actually yeah, give craven so are just <laughs> knockoffs of one of tony's favorite superheroes <laughs> Like, they give him Animal Man's powers, basically. Where he has a direct connection with animals. And just use the use those animals' abilities. So it's like an Animal man Bawana beast kind of combo. But he doesn't actually turn into the animal. It, it, it's mm -hmm. To be fair, New 52, buddy did something similar to that when the fucking red fucked with his body again. It's him. It's but you motherfuckers out here really want me to punch them in the testicles, do they? I do not. I refuse to make Craven the Hunter one of the most 
immediately underrated Spider-Man villains. A fucking knockoff of not only my favorite DC superhero, in fact, one of my favorite superheroes in general, but remind me of the fucking Halle Berry Catwoman movie. <laughs> Oh shit! I didn't yeah, even think right. about that. Oh my god! You know what? You know what else it made me think of? Now that you bring it up, this is gonna make it even worse. You know what else it just made me think of? Now that you mentioned terrible superhero yeah. movies from the early two thousands, it reminds me of the you know rightly so forgotten Electra movie where the the hand ninjas oh, right. had those uh, like spirit animal powers with their tattoos yeah. Ugh. yeah Jesus H Damn. Christ man what up uh, and uh no and does uh, also another thing about it no, no. Real quick, bro. Can I just say this real quick here? Just no problem. Go ahead. Everything can lick my left testicle all the way around to the right and punch yourself in your corresponding parts. That being your own testes or your hoo ha. I don't give a damn. I'm mad. By the way, folks. I know the entire trailer talk section is super messy and we're talking over each other and shit, and normally I would edit this out, but this is too fucking funny for me to not keep in, so we're just gonna leave it as it is. That's just also a note to future editing Jay as well. But yeah, that was trailer talk, and boy was that a doozy. I did want to say one more thing about Draven. Mm hmm. Because we mentioned it while watching it, but not on camera. We know that a Aaron Taylor Johnson can do the accent. Oh yeah, we, we talked. We talked. We talked. We actually. Accent. We actually talked about it right before too. That like, oh, he could totally do the accent. He did the accent for Quicksilver. And his father does the accent, Russell Crowe. But then him? Nope. He's American. <laughs> That's fucking Whoa. weird. Low effort. It's like the laziest. It's the laziest hentai you could ever see. Like the laziest hentai animation you've seen in your life. Oh man. Oh man. Oh man. Uh, I'm, uh, just, yeah, no. Luckily. You know, up to a couple more days that week, but, uh, luckily, folks. Yeah, um, we are actually going to be talking about a good show to cleanse our palate of that bullshit because now we're going to actually talk about the bloodhounds proper this is our full discussion on bloodhounds and this is where we are also going to place our spoiler alert for the show as well uh please if you have not watched all eight episodes of bloodhounds the netflix k-drama Please go check it out. As I mentioned at the top of the show, highly recommend it. It is a fantastic show. You will not regret it. The video will still be here when you come back. The podcast audio ain't going nowhere. You can come back to Spotify later. We'll be here. Go watch the show. It's great. So that's your spoiler alert. We'll give you some time to back away. If you need to, but well, there you go. All right, now that the uh, spoiler free people are gone, let's fucking talk about it. Okay, so our main discussion point in this week's episode is the main theme of the show, and that is heart. The heart of a boxer. So, let's talk about it. How do each of you feel about the whole heart of the boxer concept and how the show handled it? We'll start with that. So, Tony, we'll start with you. Well, for me, I like the idea that uh, Gung Wu saying it's not all about the money, it's about the heart when it came to boxing. Because it all stemmed from a discussion that both uh, Wu Jin and 
he had when they first initially met him, like in their beginnings of their friendship. How Wu Jin was talking about how Mayweather is just one of the greatest because he chased the bag, but then Gong Wu attributed to the heart of boxing to Manny Pacquiao. Now, uh, I, I want to I want to interject here real quick as a uh, as a boxing fan, and you know, this isn't just na- um, you know nationality pride bias because I'm part Filipino, but. I've had this discussion with fellow boxing fans repeatedly. You know, Floyd Floyd Money Mayweather is one of the most gifted boxers I have ever seen. He's a generational talent, no doubt. He has one of the best defensive tactics ever put on display. You cannot get a hit on this man if he really wants unless he really wants you to and that's why he was able to beat pacquiao and like i'm never going to take away from floyd's technical ability but at the end of the day floyd comes from more of the ali school of boxing in terms of like being an entertainer and a showman above being a boxer which nothing wrong with that and he made tons of money you know through it he still does shit his nickname is floyd money mayweather like like that's his whole brand so i'm never gonna knock floyd for it but pacquiao is somebody that i've always looked up to and has personally inspired me not just because i'm filipino but because Pacquiao went from this poor kid in the Philippines, barely making ends meet on a farm, to becoming a fucking national hero that made such an impact on the country and the world at large that the people trusted him enough to make him a congressman and eventually a senator. Like, this dude literally fights for change. And while I may not agree with some of his um, more outdated, disparaging comments towards a specific alphabetical community, uh, I still hold a lot of respect for the man. And... Gong Wu and Wu Jin, they definitely embody that heart of a boxer that you see in Pacquiao. If you've ever seen any of Pacquiao's fights, even just the clips, he has so much class and respect. You know, before every fight, he goes into the corner and he prays. He always, you know, shakes hands with his opponent afterwards, compliments him on the fight. When he loses, he's never, like upset or says that like it was a bad call he's like no i screwed up you know i made mistakes i was just out box here i'll do better next time and you and most of the time he comes back and he does better and that's what we see with wu jin and gung wu like they get knocked down but they get back up and they hit even harder and it's just fantastic to see oh yeah and their friendship is also I just really agree. phenomenal. I agree with that sentiment entirely. Because, let's be honest, at the beginning of the show, Wu Jin was this cocky, this arrogant prick. But Yeah, he was more the Mayweather. For yeah, sure. And over time, and with his friendship to uh, Gong Wu, he learned a thing from his friend to appreciate everything. And when he almost died, Wu Jin, uh, specifically, when this man almost fucking died, that's when he realized, really, oh shit, my way of thinking previously was not really the best way of thinking about it, you know? 
Yeah, he learns humility. Mm-hmm. And that lease on life Whoa. was great. A great lesson for him to learn. And I think he also learned this even before that event, but it really cemented to him that what Gung Wu was saying for the longest time was the right call. It, that's well, what I got out of it anyway. Okay. So, Brian. It also doesn't help. It also doesn't help. Just backing, backpacking on that for a little bit before I get into the whole thing. Is uh, the thing with Wu Jin is also he does realize that part of the reason why he did almost die was because the night before he was putting on too much of cockiness and overestimated his drinking skill. And so he wasn't at his full when he was fighting off the gang the next day. Yep, yep. It was very much a, like, kind of... And this is a weird comparison, but I still think it's apt. Uh, especially just kind of funny considering the episode we did prior to this uh, last week. It is kind of a Uncle Ben-esque situation with what happened to Mr. Choi. Because, you know, very much like Brian said, if Wu Jin wasn't like cocky and wanting to show off that he's like a big time heavy drinker he would have been more prepared and ready to take on those guys and mr Choi might have still been alive but yeah go ahead brian yeah and... no all right go ahead tony my bad uh no i was just going to add that whole moment was very telegraphed from the beginning, and I was like, well, maybe they won't actually do that. Oh, they actually did do that. Fuck me. God damn it. Yep. It, it, you, you know, but let's get to Brian, though, before we talk about that. Oh, my God. Yeah, like they said, you can really see the heart of the boxer in this, in this like, because boxing is a very brutal sport, but there's a lot of, like, honor and rules to the whole thing. And, yeah, even just in the beginning, when we first meet him, Kung Fu is full-on just part of the boxer, noble dude, just wants to be a boxer, wants to do the right thing. And then he makes the cocky... Wu Jin, who's in it for more, just like we said, the Mayweather way. You know, but, uh, actually, now that I think about it, my bad, didn't mean to cut you off there, Brian. Uh, but I, I just had a thought, and I, I want to know what you think about this because I just had this realization as you were talking, uh, because it made me think about it. You know what their friendship actually reminds me of, and I think they did this on purpose. It's Rocky and Apollo. Right. Think about it, right? Yeah, definitely. You are right on the money there, Jay. Apollo Creed is this cocky world champ, you know, undefeated, you know, undisputed, you know, well-loved. And then he gives this, you know, up-and-comer rookie a shot. And he... You know, he loses, but then they end up becoming friends afterwards. So much so to the point where, you know, when his friend dies in the ring, it's up to Rocky to take revenge. And when Wu Jin almost dies with this, it's um, Gong Wu who steps up and to take on E Honda and the rest of, uh, you know, Gil's henchmen. Yeah, but all throughout the show, you can see, like, the heart of the boxer, and the only thing think with the Gung Wu is, even though he loves boxing, and boxing is, like, his number one thing, he will still do what he can to help his mom, and even put it aside to help her, and that's all part of the reason why he gets 
drawn into the main plot. And maybe he loses a little bit of that towards vengeance, but at the end, it's actually Wu Jin who reminds him and brings him back. I also appreciate that he is not your stereo stereotypical boxing character main character where he doesn't mm -hmm. like try to solve everything with his fist Wujin actually tries to talk things out with your typical boxing protagonist they usually solve things with their fist because their fists are how they communicate with people better which you still see a little bit with Wujin like his character is more of the traditional boxing protagonist, but Gung Wu, he actually like uses his words and act makes connections with people. You know, with the the rich guy who gets blackmailed by Gil, who is the the, the heir to the hotel group. Uh, the reason he's able to get them on their side. Yep. Yeah. The reason they're supposed to get uh, the reason he's able to get them on their side is because. They sit down and have a drink and they get to know each other and they make those connections and they empathize. Um, and it's really important. So like that's uh, Gong Wu's biggest strength. And I think and I think also uh, even though he's not a even though he was never a boxer and all that, I think what attracts Gong Wu to Mr. Kim no, well not Mr. Kim, but Mr. Choi, sorry, that Mr. Choi. Mr. Choi actually was a boxer. They mentioned they mentioned that he was an amateur. Uh, I thought Mr. Kim was the boxer. No, um, Mr. Both, um, both Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Hong and Mr. Uh, Mr. Choi were boxers because. Uh, they mention when they look when they're looking over when they're looking over Gi Young's uh, fold uh, photos. Lee was... Oh, it was Lee. Oh, uh, it was Lee. But um, I remember specifically when they were looking over uh, uh, Gong Gong Wu's photos and the dossier. It's like, hey, wait, weren't you also a box? Weren't you also a boxer, Mr. Choi? It's like, yeah, but I never, I never became a champion or whatever. Uh, but I did, you know, I did have a few moves. Right. But, um, and you can see it in his flashback up. fight as well. He actually does use boxing technique. True. But my point was, you're right. You're absolutely right with that, but uh, it took being thrown out of a window to stop him. But uh, my point was that the thing that Gung Wu, like attracts him to Mr. Choi is Mr. Choi's heart and his selflessness. Which goes back into the heart of the boxer thing. For sure. So, speaking about Mr. Choi's heart, let's talk about the person that is Mr. Choi's heart, which leads into one of the other themes of this show, which is found family. So, let's talk about Juju. I'll start us off here. Juju is a really interesting character because she is this... Tough as nails, classic, guarded tomboy character who doesn't trust anyone because she was never able to because she always had to fight and protect herself. But now she has friends who can protect her so she doesn't have to shoulder the burden. And I think the most beautiful but also most tragic moment in all of this that really demonstrates how important the boys are to Juju and her character uh, is after 
Mr. Choi, her adopted grandfather, dies, and Gong Wu is just there to hold her. He doesn't say a word. He just holds her and lets her scream her head off and cry. Even though Gong Wu himself is just as attached to Mr. Choi and loves Mr. Choi like his own grandfather, but he knows that he needs to stay strong because Juju needs this. And it's just such a beautiful moment, man. And you can really tell that they're family in this moment. They're not just friends anymore. Like, it, it, it reaches the, you know, Fast and Furious, like, territory here. But yeah, let's go ahead and uh, start with Tony. And one thing that I want to add to what you were saying, Jay, uh, that one moment where they were trying to get info out of uh, that one fucker they were trying to tail at the beginning. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're talking about the guy they tortured with the, the with the circular saw and the and the salt water. Mm -hmm. And the fucker said some derogatory shit about Mr. Lee, and Mr. Huang. Mm -hmm. And how. Oh no, it was the dude that was beating up the uh, homeless guy. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And how he was saying such violent shit about the two folks that fucked him up. Right, right. And how uh, Gong Wu and uh, Wu Jin were like, nah, that that's family to us. You don't disrespect. Yeah, yeah you for don't sure. Disrespect family, and you're speaking ill of the dead on top of it. So, which, my God, seeing what happened to the old heads. Fuck, man. Dude, right? Mm -hmm. That was insane. In the, ramifications, uh, in the ramifications, what happened to, uh... Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, yeah. The, uh, with his wife? Mr. Oh, Lee. Mr. Lee. Yeah. Oh. The the only it's reason I remember good. Mr. Lee specifically no. is because Mr. I'm Lee is what? the one with the wife, and it's... Mr. Lee had the awesome motorcycle. I'm not gonna lie, mm -hmm. they definitely like '80s action movie the fuck out of Mr. Lee, because mm -hmm. I texted Brian right yeah. when I got to the, right when he got to the moment, just like, wait a minute. They just revealed he has a fam- Oh no! He has- a Of course he has a wife with a baby on the way! He's gonna die. He's gonna die. This is the equivalent in the 80s action movie cop show or drama mm -hmm. where the cop mentions ah, I'm only one day- I'm only one day away from retirement. This is it for me. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, uh, fuck. And just even though we didn't see it, the fact that Myung Gills men also killed the wife. Wait, do we know for baby? sure he killed the? They killed the wife too. Uh, the look on his face when he, when Mr. Huang asked that question. And Gil just gave that face of like, you know the fuck I would. Oh shit! I didn't even know. I didn't even. I wasn't sure. I I assumed that they left the we wife alive. Don't know for sure. Okay, we don't know for sure. Okay, good, good. Because I was like, wait, no, but she's pregnant well, no, though. Lee Gil, 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 Gil's the kind of man that wouldn't leave anything past. I mean, I don't disagree with you. Like he, he, he would no be way. the kind of motherfucker that would kill a pregnant woman. It, look, the look on his face tells it all. Plain as day, without even saying it, you you knew just by the look on his face, the smile on his face. No, I'm with you. 
I'm with you. That's why I'm not disagreeing. I, I know, Brian. It, I know, Brian. You want to give that little bit of hope that she might be still living? Nah, she ain't living. We're dealing with crazy motherfucker with a scar on one side of his face. Yeah. Do you really think she's gonna let that go? He's not gonna let anything slide. Well, uh, especially when two you're things. An uh, animal. Tony, did you turn your push to start back on? He did. He, I, I see him periodically okay. glowing. He's just pressing the button more often. Yeah? Why? Okay. All right, my bad. But uh, back to this, though. We also know that this guard motherfucker will also lie to people to get a reaction out of them. And he, they likely did it. But I'm just saying it's not 100 percent. But you there, Brian. But, but also uh, a point, a point to in Tony's favor to that she is actually dead. I feel like if she was alive, we would have gotten a scene where they like got her to safety, or they would have mentioned that they brought her to safety. I feel you. I feel you. But uh, yeah. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> It, it's it's like that one moment when they try to get rid of the uh, special, like the special police force that uh, they put together, and Homegirl got rid of. Ooh. Damn, that was crazy, bro. That poor, ra yeah. that poor random pedestrian. Yeah, that wasn't a random pedestrian, Jay. No, that was Homegirl who was the tech support. Oh shit! Dang, that's crazy. They even said that they put that girl in a coma because she got hit with that garbage truck. Oh, okay, okay. Because I, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, I remember the, I remember the other guy in the task force like got stabbed the fuck up in the shower, and then, you know, home, uh, rich dude's cousin mm -hmm. got his Starbucks poisoned. Cousin, yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, the cousin which, got poisoned by... Which, that was a very intense scene that came out of nowhere. It, you know oh, what yeah. it reminded me of? Speaking mm -hmm. of an episode that uh, the Twitch audience will know, but the, like, audio-only audience will not be able to listen to. It reminded me of Kaleidoscope when the that scene where the, uh, the CIA lady dies... After being oh, bumped yeah. by uh, the random like hitman, yeah, like blinking, you'll miss it. Mate. Yep, yep, yep. But when I just say came out of nowhere, I meant the whole like shaky, fuzzy cam as he as he's poisoned. It's something that we never really had established before. Them doing that kind of filmography but it was still really good oh yeah for sure so to touch on another point that brian brought up earlier uh since we're still talking about found family let's go ahead and talk about how wujin has been integrated into gong Wu's family with his mom because his mom has done such a phenomenal job of embracing this young man who has in such a short time made a huge impact on her son's life. So let's talk about, you know, Gong Wu's mom and her impact on the story, not only being obviously the catalyst of the main plot, but like her affecting both Wu Jin or Jin Wu and Juju. Because she and Juju have a lot of great moments as well, even though they're not as. Um, Often as she has with uh, Wu Jin, uh, Jin Wu. So go ahead, Brian. I let Tony go first last time, so I'll let you go first this time. Well, just real quick before I do, I never really got to talk about Juju. Sure. Go ahead. I I think she was a really cool character, and uh, I like that she got to be in the three versus thirty fight. Which was epic. That overpass fight was amazing. 
Yeah. It was an amazing fight. And uh perfect choreography. And I do like the fact how uh she uh she wasn't as experienced as the other two. So she definitely had like kind of in D D terms, two weapon fighting, one hand a taser, the other a baton that she was treating like the kendo stick. Yep, that was fucking cool. It was, and uh, her not being part of like the so final she did, act. She, kind of training. And, uh, she did. Yeah. And her not, and her leaving, and not being a part of the final act. Kind of disappointed, but also I totally get it because Mr. Choi's whole thing was about protecting her and getting her and making sure that she was safe. So. By honoring his memory, she's GTFOing. I also think it's important for Juju because it's her breaking the cycle, you know? Indeed. Because yeah, Mr. Choi that, also realized when, when the fuck to get out of the game and to bring kind of anime terms into this, even though this isn't an anime, and weebs will understand this uh, if you're a fan of this particular franchise. I think this was a better version. I think Juju got fugo but it's much better handled. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because... Juju leaves the story because our main characters are Gongwu and Wu Jin. And while Juju was important and you know they're doing a lot of this for Juju, she's also not in the right mental state to be able to do this. And if she had continued I don't think it would have felt right. So her leaving and breaking the cycle is yeah. an even bigger character development, I feel like. I totally get you. And it even makes sense because uh, you're saying that and the whole thing about how those are two leads. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking here and even on the Wikipedia, there are only four main cast members. Gung... Gung Wu, Wu Jin, Mr. Choi, and Gil. Makes sense. But mm -hmm. yeah, about uh I was just gonna put it back. It's okay, I can edit this, it's fine. Yeah. You go ahead, Brian, I'm sorry. It's all right, thanks. Uh, but I was just going to pull it back to what you were asking me originally, which is about Mrs. Kim. It, Young Wu's mom. No, uh, Kim is Kim. Kim is Gil. Remember, that's the um, she's not Mrs. Kim. What? Kim is Gil. She's not Mrs. Kim. What the heck? Then this uh, Wikipedia has might be off. Yeah. But uh, anyway. Go yeah, cause yeah, mom, cause, yeah, so, cause uh, yeah, cause yeah, cause yeah, cause yeah, cause remember, uh, his, his name is Kim Young Gil. But uh, anyway, back to. And, what I was uh, saying, though. Uh, mom. Last name is also Kim. Ah, okay. Yes. So it is Mrs. Kim. Okay. Never mind. You yeah. were right. We'll keep that in. But, uh, I think they even make that statement of, uh, he has the same last name. But, uh, anyway, what I was trying to get at is she definitely is a very nurturing Kind of maybe a little bit more softer version of Aunt May, where she's a very motherly figure to, like, outcasts and 
definitely recognizes that these people need moms. She's still trying to mother her kid, but also takes in these other kids. And one moment that I really liked with her was um, a very good moment where it's like the things not said. And that's the scene where where she's cooking for them and uh, they suggest that she go cook for the, the orphanage because she's such a good cook and those kids could really use her. And granted, those kids could and probably need that extra motherly figure, but also it's full of things not said where it's like, in the worst case scenario, we don't want you here to protect you. For sure. Definitely feel that. Yeah. Well, yeah, she's a very good motherly figure, and that's all. Okay. Cool. So, now, we talked about the friendship between Wu Jin and Yun Wu. So let's talk about the other good guy friendship that is probably like my second favorite bromance of this show. Because there are three major bromances. We, again, we talked about Gong Wu and Wu Jin. The other one is Mr. Hong and Mr. Lee. Love these guys. Love these guys. They feel like yeah. old war buddies. They were delinquents together. They came up under Mr. Choi. They have this strong sense of loyalty. And they feel like brothers. Much so to the point where, you know, Lee admits to Hung, Yeah, I got a wife and a kid. Well, why didn't you tell me, you fucking dumbass? Because I knew if I told you, you'd tell me not to come. And I needed to finish this, and I wasn't going to let you do this alone. It was very... Yes, it's cliche, but man, does it still hit. It still hit. How do you guys feel about the bromance of Mr. Hong and Mr. Lee? Tony, we'll start with you. Those bros, great mentors, great friends, really looked out for our main boys, sad that they're gone, looked out for each other, looked out for the lads, looked out for Juju, really looked up to Mr. Joy, rest in peace to you fucking legends. Yep, Brian? For sure. Um, it was kind of interesting because at one point it was like Lee was a mentor for Juju. Hun was a mentor for for uh, Wu Jin. And uh, Mr. Choi was the mentor for Gung Wu. But uh, those two specifically, the right and left hand, yeah, you can really tell that there's a lot of history behind them. And uh, definitely the bromance, you can tell it. Even though we're only catching, like, the tail end of it, you can still tell I'm not going to lie to you. Another... If this becomes a franchise, I would totally watch a prequel spinoff of Mr. Hong mm -hmm. and Mr. Lee. That, that, that yeah, I, I want that. Give me that. Even though you kind of know that it's going to be kind of a sad ending. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Better Call Saul is successful. Oh, yeah. But, but yeah, both of them, they're both really good fighters, but they're both different fighters. And just the way that they do things is really cool. And they slowly introduce them. Because this show is really good at, like, slow character introductions where you think someone is just, like, a small supporting character, but then they come 
back into the plot big later. Like Mr. Moon. Like these two guys are definitely. Mm hmm. Fucking Mr. Moon, man. Oh, yeah. All right, so uh, speaking of side characters, before we jump into uh, the final bromance, let's kind of just quickly touch on some of the side characters. Some of my favorites are Mr. Moon and the one snitch guy who, like, becomes, like, the... Oh, yeah. He becomes, like, the Turk of bloodhounds and i love his relationship with the boys because he just like yeah man yeah, yeah. Sh so what i work for him he's a fucking dickhead i want to see him gone too yeah ever since he's gone crazy he's worked us to the bone yeah, it was. I love that whole like the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and just when they give him the tip, and he's just like, "Yo, what the fuck? I was hoping for a million. I love that shit. It was really funny, and like and his comedic bits were definitely up. needed with all this intense seriousness going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because usually our comedic our comedic element was Wu Jin, but he's kind of. A little bit more eventual and serious now. Mm -hmm. For sure. So, side characters. Go through a character arc. Go through a character arc. Good guy. Hey, but that... The, uh... That one thug fucker. I'm gonna call him Homeless Joe, just for the sake of... Memorizing. I mean, we, we, did, we did mostly see him in the homeless getup, so sure. Yeah, so Homeless Joe... Begging for money, still doing shady bullshit instead of being caught on as through the homeless person scheme now of just attacking disabled people, which you fucking disgusting asshole. Let him let him let, 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 let him try me. Let him try me. Yeah. Which apparently his name is Jay Myung. Okay. Yeah. But still, homeless Joe works. You know, yeah. that that guy yeah. feels you, like a Yakuza so NPC. He really does. Yeah. God damn it. But at least he redeemed himself a little bit. Oh yeah, for sure. A little bit. Still smarmy. Mm, but this much. I mean, let's not forget... In his first appearance, he almost killed a dude. Yep. Oh. True. Side, char almost side characters almost. that we did not touch on. Uh, Mr. Moon, which I briefly mentioned. He's really fun. I loved his team up with the boys. And um, Mr. Moon uh, in, in the whole uh, like military paint camo get up and then you know his little banter with Mr. O's granddaughter he's he's given he's given the boys his plan and then he stops in the middle of it wait wait wait, wait. who the hell are you I'm here to save my grandpa oh okay cool wait oh you're Mr. O's that? granddaughter <laughs> no you know you guys have similar faces I can see it <laughs> that shit was. And fun. then the fact that he didn't know what a compound bow was. Yep, that was great. I think he was having a dumb fuck moment right there. He really was. Mr. Yeah. Moon is yeah, a he... great combination of like a good comedic character, but he was also fucking badass as shit. Yeah, for sure. And he had, uh, uh, he had a lot of just like scene where. <laughs> You can go ahead, Brian. I was just gonna say he had a lot of subtle moments too, like the fact of them complimenting him on the face paint, and he's like, "It's very itchy. I think it's fire, but oh well." My favorite thing is the nicknames he gives to people. They're hilarious. Like my favorite is that he calls the the motherfucker that they end up like tying up. 
a track team because she fucking chases him all throughout that goddamn mall. That was fucking. That was awesome. Same shit. Were you on the track team or something? Fuck. Also, one thing that I love about Mr. Moon's like comedic timing, but it's still played for like seriousness, and just by the deadpan delivery of like the dub itself, which is hysterical, at least to me, where Mintz voicing the character said, well, it's either job or family, while pointing an arrow straight at this motherfucker's crush. That was my, uh, that was my favorite scene. It's like, you gotta make an important decision here, buddy. Your job, or your work, or your family. Which one's it gonna be? I don't know which one I'd choose. Mm-hmm. It's like, even the question, do you have a family? <laughs> Motherfucker was took it aback and like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, oh. Yeah, and then when he didn't talk for a bit, he was like, hey, I, so you're sticking with job. I can mend you, but I can never do that. Man, that that little moment of the unhinged side of Mr. Moon was just so good. A lot of personality for such a, like, small side character. Just chef's kiss on that. Good job to the actor who played him. Also, Mr. Yeah, o... Sure good at doing that. Mm -hmm. Also, Mr. O and uh, his granddaughter were great, too. The gag... About yeah. her with her computer, I thought was really funny. Like mm -hmm. every time oh, yeah. the the boys Tyrant. use it for research, she gets a notification and she just runs in here like, "What the fuck? Who said you could use that?" Uh, it smells like sad old. It smells like sad men in here. Ah oh, man. And then she got excited when they followed through in their promise with the humidifier. Yep. Which, by the way, those things are really great for, uh, like, just removing your personal smell from the room. Like, highly recommend getting one of those. Like, uh, it's, it's really good for, like, small spaces, especially if you have a small room. Her and Gung Wu had really good chemistry, too. Yeah. She had a little bit of chemistry with Wu Jin, honestly. Oh yeah, that's what I meant. My bad. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I I I like that. At the at the end, you know, at first she was very standoffish, like I'm only doing this because Grandpa told me to. But after they had their like trial by fire friendship, she daps them up, and she's like, "You have my number." She looks at Wu Jin, and she's like, "Text me." And he's just like, yeah, I got you. Which probably isn't going to go anywhere because she's like, it seems like at least they portray it that she's a lot younger than them. Like, but I'm not sure. At the start of adulthood because she has her own apartment. Yeah, yeah she, she has her, alone. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. She might, she might be like a couple, a couple years younger than them, but because that they're only, they're only like in their, the, uh, like, I know, like Wu Jin is in his like late twenties, and Gong Wu is in his like early twenties. He's twenty-seven. Yep. Yeah. Wait, they're two years apart because. Wu Jin said he was 27, and Gung Wu is 25. Okay, yeah. So, she, so yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yep, so she's got to be like 18-ish. So, it's, it wouldn't be creepy if anything happened between Wu Jin, or Jin Wu and uh, Mr. O's granddaughter. But, personally, I'm okay. I wouldn't want it to happen. They never confirmed her age, so we don't know for sure. But uh, I do, now that you mentioned it, Tony, I do remember that because um, they were talking about all respect and everything. And that's when they found out that uh, Wu Jin was older, but Gung Wu 
was a higher um, rank. Yep, in the Marines, which, you yep. know, the Marine thing and Marine pride comes back a lot when, uh, you know, we mentioned that Mr. Uh, Hung was a mentor to Wu Jin. Yeah. And a lot of that is because he was a senior Marine and he, uh, you know, Wu Jin definitely looked up to him. So that was cool. He, he actually mentored both uh, Gung, Gung Wu and Wu Jin. Mm -hmm. Taught those boys how to fight with knives. It's great. Oh, yeah. So let's now talk about the final bromance of the show, the dark mirror of our two main boys. We've got Gil and E Honda. Yeah. All right. So let's so let me start with this. So I know E Honda has a real name, folks, but this guy built like a brick shit house and the first thing I thought of because I've been playing a lot of Street Fighter lately is that this motherfucker is just straight up E Honda like I could see him sumo throwing motherfuckers to death so that's just what I ended up calling him it was easier in my notes to just call him E Honda but he is loyal to a fault and you know, even though Gil is a horrible, horrible motherfucker, you have a lot of respect for E Honda for holding it down no matter what. Like, I'm not saying it's right, but I at least, like, commend the man for being ride or die for his brother, you know? Yeah. I could definitely see that, and also the fact that they both did time in prison together, so that part of their dynamic makes sense too. Yep, for sure. Also, it gives another cool in uh, like element to uh, Gil, so he's not like completely one note. Yeah, and I like yeah, the I family aspect to Gil and E Honda. Because, you know, he doesn't trust most of his people. But when he is alone and he talks to Honda, he goes, Look, Honda, no matter what, everyone else could turn on me. But you and me, I'll make sure you're good no matter what. Because we are family. You're a brother to me. You are my brother. I'm going to look out for you no matter what. Which is why the moment where, like... Honda tries to unalive himself to essentially protect Gil. Yeah. Like, I admit, I was, there was a part of me that was like, well, damn, you've got balls, buddy. I respect it. Yeah, he was laughing at them to hit him, and he was never going to tell them. And then he goes and, like, tries to bite off his own tongue. Yep. Fucker was insane. Oh, yeah. But he would do anything to help out his bro. Yeah, and yeah. that part of his character is commendable, even if his brother is, like, the worst. So now, this is probably the meat and potatoes of our discussion. Let's talk about the boy Gil. Zashu. And let's be honest. Asshole. Let's be honest. Gil, this Gil would definitely call people mongrels. Like I could totally hear him calling somebody a mongrel. You know, mongrel wouldn't be too nice for some people. You know. Yep. What What's beneath a mongrel? I don't know, but yeah. Shit, anything. But man, Gil. Me and Brian had the same thought uh, when it comes to this dude. Yep. He has major kingpin energy because at least in the beginning before he starts oh. 
getting lost in the sauce in terms of vengeance. He is not only feared and respected by his men, but his men also love him and are willing to jump into the fire for him. He's got a lot of presence and charisma to him, and he's very subtle and calculated with all his moves. So it's, it feels very kingpin. But he can also get his hands dirty. And if he feels wrong or wronged or disrespected, he will make sure to make an example out of that person. Oh, yeah, indeed. Um, and also, like kingpin, uh, two other things about him is, uh, one, he's trying to be as legal as he can yep. while doing all of this. Can and also, like Kingpin, especially Denofrio's Kingpin, even when he's like not doing much, you can just feel the menace off of him. Like he can say and do like all the right things, but even in the dub, you can just tell the menace of Gil. He's also got his own Wesley to, you know, keep the Daredevil Kingpin uh, analogy going. He has his own Wesley in glasses. Glasses yeah. also turned out to be a pretty good character. Even though he ended up kind of useless in the end. Weak ass yeah. bitch. I called him weak ass bitch. When I... That's why he doesn't deserve a name. I, that's why I just listed him as Glasses. But the fact that the, the fucker survived getting his neck. Yeah, his throat slashed? Yeah, that's crazy. Oh, yeah. Cheeky fuck. Lived. Damn. But it's it's because Gil has his own like hospital. Yep. Basically. Yeah. Because he learned that from Choi. And Choi probably learned that from the Italian mob. But yeah, uh just the thing about the hospital though, real quick, that scene where you see like the aftermath of the of the three versus thirty fight where all the henchmen are just in the hall. Oh yeah. The, Oh yeah, that was great. So, to really kind of bring the guild discussion into overdrive, let's talk about the big the big thing. The flashback, the Choi flashback. The origin of why Choi is in the wheelchair. And I got to say it's an awesome ass wheelchair. I looked up that brand just out of curiosity and too rich for my blood, but damn, those things are nice. So yeah, <laughs> flashback. Wow. Holy shit. Wow. Yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. One thing I gotta say about that whole flashback. I just gotta say this in general, because it's a comparison that I've made to myself, but I didn't tell this to the guys, but Mr. Choi just reminds me of a very Korean Sly Stallone. Yeah, I can see that. It, it, it may be a bit weird to some people, but... It's just the mannerisms the actor gives. Just and also the and also the characteristics of the character. He's very much a underdog, blue collar, like fights for the people type. Yeah, and uh, when the in the flashback when you see him, where he's like wearing that leather jacket all the time. Mm -hmm. For sure. See the slide Stallone. But yeah, that flashback was amazing. Uh, like I said before, he kept going, Mr. Choi, and the only thing that stopped him was being thrown out of a window, and that didn't even completely stop him. I also just love how, like, you could tell that Honda respected Choi's prowess as a fighter, because when he saw that the body wasn't there, he was like, oh shit. Oh shit, he's coming back. Fuck. What do we do, Gil? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Fuck, 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 fuck. 
And then Gil had to smack his boy and be like, no, Honda, relax. They probably just took his body, took him to the hospital. He's not going to be a problem. Just get the fucking money out the safe and let's go. And burn the shit down as we leave. Yep. Mm -hmm. One thing that I could also really just like about a villain that's that Gilda, the kind of villain Gil is, he had his motivations painted on his face from the moment we saw that flashback and the moment we first see him. Mm -hmm. It's all about that green, making sure that he could screw over so many people, but also making money at the same time. And yeah, because it's made abundantly clear when they basically pointed out the plan to us the second time in the show, but it's from a different perspective from our leads instead of Gil himself, with how technically you're not supposed to be making money from the casino because it's crime there to be gambling, but except with the exception of foreigners. And when Mr. Lee and Mr. Huang mentioned, like, basically explained it, the whole, uh, what Gil's plan was for the casino is like, oh shit, that's how a bunch of money laundering can happen. Making sure you pay off gambling debts Yep. with a little bit of loan here and there. Big loan sharking. Eating small loan sharking. Yeah. Shit was wild, man. I also like Gil's descent into madness and his oh, loss of control God. because he starts out on top being able to manipulate everybody. He's like five steps ahead of everyone. He has all this dirt and blackmail. He has everyone around in his pocket. The cops, politicians, different things like that. But soon, once, you know... Gong Wu and Wu Jin figure out his game and they start like flipping his allies he just starts losing his shit and he just becomes totally unhinged and it is just so fascinating it makes that final fight that much more impactful because instead of this calm cool collected calculated boss in that final fight, he's a trapped, cornered animal. Mm -hmm. And remember what they said about, you know, yeah. cornered animals will bite, uh, you know, bite back. Mm-hmm. And yeah. It's a parallel I actually made about Gil within this podcast alone. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating to see, like, the the regression of someone, who, like you said, who was on top, the kingpin of his own domain, the king of his own kingdom, but only to have one moment, that one Jenga piece that moves ever so slightly away from the tower that came crumbling down. Because we, we know the types of villains that are like this, that think... Oh, I'm untouchable. Nothing can really knock me down. You know, and the moment where he actually had that moment where he lost it was when his phone and keys were initially burned. Yep. He oh, yeah. I was going to bring that up. He got so mad, but then he remembered. Oh, yeah, that's right. I still have the cloud connected to a laptop that had all the videos on that drive. So I could still win. But yep. only to have that turn around on his ass. To have him get fucking which busted. Escalated, which escalated to him trying to take out the cops that busted him. You know? Yep. Yep. Okay. He... I love that moment where he just freaks out because he's got the image on, he's got the ladies and the other people partying, and then mm -hmm. 
he smells it, runs towards it, and then he starts screaming. And his main squeeze is just like, "Nope, party's over." I know that scream. Go. Yep. His his girl his, his, his girlfriend yeah, just looks at him, looks at his uh, looks at his boys like, "All right, get the hookers out of here." <laughs> get the sh you y'all can take the champagne with you. Get the hookers out of here. We gotta go. We got an emergency. <laughs> and then she actually calms him down, and he gets a, like a little bit to the calm that we knew him from before. But then that goes out the window very soon. Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And also, I love how crafty he was trying, how smart he was thinking. Still sending the video to Mr. Huang. Or Mr. Hong. Yep. About, oh, I still have this video, bitch. What you gonna do about it? And I'm taking out your cousin, taking out your cousin's entire crew. What you gonna do? You're gonna still be under my thumb, bitch. Only the one, the one place where he fucked up was underestimating uh, Hong's cousin's intelligence. And also, the balls that like this guy grew. The character development that we saw from him is substantial. He starts off as this like pompous arrogant prick who like honestly yeah. you at first feel like deserves to get manipulated and humiliated like that but then we see how much of a good guy he is and how he actually does want to do good with the world and with his dad's money but he has his family's expectations thrust upon him because he comes from a powerful family and yeah. Like, it, it's just really cool to see the evolution of his character as well. Also, yeah. Drunk, when he drunkenly admits that the stress that uh, Gil has put him through made him get hemorrhoids, I'm like, you poor fucker. Right? You oh, man. That. Yeah. He deserves that. Gil was a literal pain in his ass. Mm hmm. Also, uh,. Press induced hemorrhoids, though, bro. Ugh. Yeah, man. No. Yeah, and they, uh, there were subtle moments with him where he knew what he was doing and that he knew what he was doing because, um, like, um, uh, how he knew that it was salt that he needed to throw or to induce himself to throw up so that he could get rid of the poison. Yep. But the the stare the stare the stare down that the that rich boy had with Gil was amazing, and I I, I love it. You you know he's like, where'd this confidence come from? I learned it from you. Mm -hmm. I like it. I don't. Yeah, no, that was great. <laughs> great, great line delivery. But it is officer cousin should have realized a little bit sooner that maybe there are cops on the inside that were in Gil's pocket. Yeah, that feels like a major oversight, personally, yeah. but I get it. Yeah. It, it, with that, eh, but it's fine. It did take me, it took me out of it just a little bit, but it is what it is. Just for the sake of drama. And also to... Just know that the team that the cousin built to get Gil is still kicking. It makes me happy. Oh, yeah. Because we could possibly see them in a like, season two. Yeah, so uh, homeboy that got stabbed, he's still kicking, but he's a bit damaged because he got stabbed in around the same areas as uh, Wu Jin did. Yep. Uh, homegirl is in a coma. She was tech support. Yeah. Thankfully, she Poor wasn't isekai Mm-hmm. She didn't get isekai she, She's in a coma, though, so... She might... So, she actually might be isekai Or she might just be in line to be isekai right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She's on that border between fucking traveling to a new world <laughs> or just staying in her... Tech support living life being a nervous little lamb. Oh man, I just I just saw I just saw a light novel title in my head. Uh I'm in the waiting room to be 
reincarnated into a new world. Uh, nice. I might actually also, something like that. Oh man. Also, uh, just one other thing that we didn't mention, which just have to bring it up, is we talked about Gil's plan. But can we take a minute to point out Gil's? Uh, you see the how he makes people disappear. Oh yeah. And runs them into fucking paste. That was crazy. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. savage. Ugh. That shit with the fish farm. Oh man. Like yeah. it gives a whole like it gives a whole new meaning to that whole old school mob phrase of sleeping with the fishes. Like shit. Also, I just thought about something. That uh goes to also part of that scene goes to talk about like how he's not Gil's not thinking as much as he normally should. And he's about thinking about like the other side and how bad this could go. He did not consider the fact of having the final showdown in that place would mean that the police would come and the police would discover his whole plot. Yep. Because he. Yep. He got floppy and he got cocky. He a... Yep. He got he had a dumb bitch moment. Mm -hmm. he, he just ended up writing himself out. That man several times in this stopped people that worked for him and said, "Hey." Think about this. Think about it in the worst scenario. Let's go with that. And he always kept thinking, but then in the end, he just wasn't thinking. He was cornered, like you said. Yep, yep, yep. yep. And when you feel like you're being attacked on all sides, what don't you do? Lash out. <laughs> and that's exactly what uh, happened. What don't you do? When you're cornered, you don't think exactly. You just act, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Oh man. So but, let's go ahead and uh, transition to final thoughts now and ratings. So Tony, final thoughts and ratings. Crazy ride. Wasn't expecting what I received. Definitely a good. I needed a good crime drama just for hood rat energy. I got it. I didn't expect it to be money laundering, but well, hey, it is what it is. And I want to give this show, you know what, just for something that I really needed, just to. Spice my uh, existence up a little bit. I'm just gonna give it a just a nine point five. Ooh, interesting. Okay, okay, very interesting. Because the point five is just because I needed that spice, but other than that, definitely something I would highly recommend. It you're gonna feel things. You're gonna feel excitement. You're gonna feel pain. Your heart's just gonna ache, and the last few moments where there's that bit of hope perfect and it ends perfectly too i just gotta say that highly recommend this 9.5 and that 0.5 might be a bit of an embellishment but it, it's just gonna be there just all so right you know. brian final thoughts and ratings i'm gonna be honest with you I think that this is one of the best shows that we've ever covered. For sure. And it's one of the best shows that I've seen in a very long time. And some of the best action I've seen in a while, definitely outside of the John Wick franchise. Fair. That is very fair. Very true. And like they said, it's not all about action. There's still good drama and some good comedy and like even the smaller characters like track suit get like a little bit of characterization and it's very well written in my opinion and very well done i really enjoyed it honestly 
Um, well, uh, first of all, I just want to say, if we do get a season two, I will be glad. But if we don't, I'm cool with this just being a one and done. There's not much that I could see them continuing, maybe one or two plots. But if they do, I'm still excited because of how good it was. And I trust them if they want to continue this. So, in the end, love this show. And honestly, this might have been the first time in a while. But um, I think I'm going to agree with Tony, 9.5. Well, shit, this is a rare once in a blue moon occasion. I'll go ahead and start with the rating because this is just super rare. We are all in complete agreement. I also give it a 9.5. Oh my god. <laughs> all right. So, but also, mm -hmm. before you start, Jay, let me point something out to you guys that I think we've neglected to say. All right. It said during COVID. Yeah, and it actually does a very good job at, like, illustrating that Indeed. world, and it doesn't make it annoying. Well, they don't beat you over the head with it. Definitely. Well, see, the whole entire thing about COVID is COVID is actually part of the plot. It's not just the setting. Yeah, because it affected the economy, and, you know, the, the whole thing had to do with money laundering. Yeah, which led to the loan sharks be loan sharking. Yep. So, my final thoughts... Yeah, the reason I gave this a 9.5 is, like, I racked my brain, and, like, other than the fact that I called all the twist, and it w had a lot of, like, small cliche moments, they weren't enough to detract an entire point. So I couldn't go as far as giving it just a 9. And this was the first show where I just physically couldn't put it down. So it was like, well, damn, dude, I don't know what I want to do here. Like, I can't give it a 10 because it's not perfect, but like, damn, if it isn't close. Like, fantastic writing, amazing top-notch action and choreography, great music, great characters. Um, personally, I think this would be better as a one-and-done with a spin-off following Juju and her journey. But I would also be okay with a season two if they decide to do it and they focus more on the boxing journey of Wujin and uh, Gongwu. Like, I'm totally down to watch just a whole boxing show with them. Like... I'll do I'll do that for sure, but yeah, nine point five, totally recommend it. Uh, this is a first here on the podcast, folks. We are all in unison, in complete agreement. So that should wow. tell you, go ahead, watch Bloodhound. It's amazing. So that's it for this week's episode of the Channel Twitch Podcast. Next week we will be. Covering Kong Skull Island, the new Netflix animated series, which I'm super hyped about. Can't wait to talk about that. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, do all the usual YouTube things. And yeah, also rate us on Spotify. It helps us be more discovered by people in that algorithm. So definitely check that out. Until next time, we will catch you later. Peace.